Hi everybody, I am here at the Coalition on Homelessness in San Francisco and I'm here with Jennifer and you're the Executive Director? Yeah, I'm Executive Director of the Coalition on Homelessness. And this is an organization that I love and adore. We met many years ago, Bevan came dragging me through here. Yeah, yeah. And I've wanted to interview her for years, just schedules didn't allow and you are in and out of the door all the time yeah <laughs> so this is i'm going to go and buy a lottery ticket after this um what first tell me a little bit about the coalition on homelessness and the work you do and then let's go into what's going on in san francisco yeah so the coalition on homelessness is an organization that's been around uh, quite a while a few decades now and uh, basically what we do is organize homeless people um, to create permanent solutions to homelessness and then we fight to protect the rights of folks um, human rights of folks that are forced to stay on the streets uh, so what that means is we're going out and doing a bunch of outreach getting input from people and then creating an agenda and fighting for it whether it means going to the ballot like we did this last November in one Prop C, which is a, a tax on basically income over 50 million of corporations in San Francisco, and it creates $300 million a year um, to uh, build housing, shelters, um, and behavioral health treatment for homeless people to working on small policy changes way at the other end, like, you know, when families have to show up and line up at a shelter every night at three o'clock and getting to have a call in so that the kids um, can go to after school programs, you know? So it really runs the gamut, but our agenda is completely directed by homeless people. Half of our staff are lived experience with homelessness and um, our board and we're really uh, what's considered a homeless led organization. One of the things that I saw you do, and I'm pretty sure it was you speaking, was at a city council meeting many years ago and you had a board of how people have to walk to all these four places at the time right. to register for shelter and what they had to carry. And it was really impressive. I mean, I've been working with homeless people. I've been homeless myself, and I've never seen anybody really statig statistically, uh, you know, put it in such a way that, gosh, I hope it woke somebody up. Yeah, that was that was after we released a report called The Runaround, which is another way we do our work is, is that we basically do peer research where homeless folks go out and gather information from other homeless people. And um, we did this big uh, thing on shelter and specifically shelter access. We found on average that people were spending 18 hours a day trying to get a shelter bed. And we did with that actually force a massive change. So now we have a call-in system and it's through 311 and it's much more simplified and just basically took um, all the runaround over getting 90 day beds. Of course, we have a wait list now of about 1200 people um, and uh, that's unfortunate, but um, the rest of it is much more simplified. I travel a little bit. The only place that I know of that has a reservation system is here. Yeah. Like this. And it doesn't seem to work very well. Yeah. Well, you know, the system was developed from a lot of input from homeless people. And so basically, you know, there was this whole thing about, you know, do you show up at the shelter? Um, do you, are you able to call? Are you able to, um, you know, we don't have enough shelter beds is part of the, really the bigger part of the issue. Um, not as much the access system itself. It, the access system is actually pretty simple. It's just that we have the largest unsheltered population on the West Coast. We have the fewer proportionally number of shelter beds. So we have this massive number of people trying to get shelter and that's what creates the problem. Um, but the rest of it's relatively easy in terms of the call-in system. Now, the city superimposed a lot of other stuff on people. So biometric imaging of your finger and face, um, having to get TB tests before you go in, um, and that kind of thing. So that that creates more rigor and more for folks, um, for sure. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's interesting. We just, we did a, actually with Bevan Dufty, we did a really 
inclusive process and um, this was the system that basically homeless people voted for. Now, from what you're saying, the this the the kind of the reservation system works. It's the bottleneck of not enough shelter yeah, beds, no yeah. housing. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. That's the problem exactly. So you got a big bottleneck getting into shelter, and then of course a big, you know, I guess massive pool of people that you're dumped into that are competing for housing when you come out the other end. So it's very. Um, very difficult and um, you know at this point you have to be homeless for you know 20 plus years um, to be in that tier one to be able to get permanent housing so yeah. that's pretty brutal as well it's, it's all in all a very brutal system you were recently I uh, within probably the last month you were I believe at City Hall with a bunch of homeless moms yeah yeah we were for Mother's Day um, we were on the front steps of City Hall and um, they actually designed the whole protest and carried it off, and um, did. You a, mean homeless people did? The mo yeah, the homeless moms, yeah. That yeah. is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> so they um, yeah and chose the speakers and you know basically just designed the entire thing. Um, had a brunch before where um, you know folks who uh, mo uh, moms who used to be homeless and are now housed cooked the food for the rest of the moms. And then had a big um, kind of, you know, Mother's Day celebration. And then everyone walked down to City Hall together. We had a big protest on the steps. And then they went up and visited each of the supervisors and brought them little um, uh, individualized kind of Mother's Day gifts with personal messages from them. Very cool. Um, urging them to basically, what you know, we've got this massive... Um, a budget in San Francisco and as a result we have a massive budget request so we have about a hundred million dollars in budget requests that we're putting through the city for housing um, for behavioral health care primarily some jobs in there um, a little bit of emergency services but um, mostly behavioral health and housing and um, the moms went around to each of the supervisors and and urged them to support that let me ask you because you guys are the experts when people are in survival mode it's really hard to get them politically active mm -hmm. they're worried about a place to sleep something to eat security what are your tips for other organizations that want to really rally homeless people to start having more of a voice yeah yeah well it's it is it's a big barrier but First of all, got to remember, like in all organizing, it's kind of a um, numbers game. Um, so more people you talk to, more people you got. Um, and you have to basically have a structure. I mean, this um, or community organizing structure here was developed kind of organically, um, but it is designed around homeless people and it's not, it looks a little different than traditional organizing. We try to capture people's voices wherever we can. So if the person is in full crisis mode, maybe we just capture you know, their voice in terms of what it is that they're fighting for, and then we try to bring that forward in our struggle. Um, and other times, you know, folks are able to be involved in coming to meetings and being involved more extensively. A lot of that has to do with creating a warm and welcoming space where people can just um, be and be part of the organization um, and having very inclusive meetings. And so, you know, that can be a bonus for homeless people where they can have a little bit of stability during their days. And it's so, there's such a massive payoff for being involved. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about kind of, you know, trauma centered care, there's all this stuff, research around um, youth, for example, um, who are trying to recover from trauma. And if they're politically active and feel like they're, they have yeah. a, uh, strong, you know, basically um, control over their own destiny, that is a very healing process to get through trauma because they, you know, they're empowered and they have control. And it's, it's really the same idea. So homeless folks get a lot out of being involved, yeah. but you also have to adjust for the fact that you got to be able to have other ways to capture those voices. So we do like 15 or 20 outreaches a week um and in a bunch of different sites then we gather that information then we have these big open meetings where everybody's welcome and then we kind of hash out what our our plan is 
um, for the week and for the upcoming months and sometimes for the upcoming years. Um, and then we work our way through it. Yeah. Just to clarify, because outreach is a very generic word in homeless services and typically used for a social services worker who's handing out granola bars. Right, right. And uh, trying to do the best they can, but there's not enough housing, but they got a granola bar. Um, what I love about how the Coalition on Homelessness, they do outreach to listen. And if you've been following Invisible People, even for just a little bit of time, I rant a lot about this. There's, you know, every executive, every person that works in homeless services, every politician that makes any decision, if you're a program manager of a foundation, if you touch homelessness, you should be out listening to homeless people. Yes. Not listening. formally homeless people. They can only tell you what homelessness was like two years ago. You need to be listening to homeless people that are outside now. And I want to hone in on that word listening. Please. Because, <laughs> I mean, when, we, when we're going out there, we're letting people know, you know, what they're, you know, maybe giving some information on the rights, upcoming opportunities to affect change. But you're listening. That is not the same as going out and trying to sell something to them that you're trying to do and get them on board with what you're fighting for. Right. That is not listening. Right. And that is not including them in a struggle. And that's where, you know, I think a lot of people make mistakes on, on organizing because they think that organizing is the same thing as mobilizing and it's not. Good point. Because you're not just mobilizing people to turn out to a protest. That does happen sometimes. But way before that, you're figuring out what your demands are at the protest. And the demands at the protest come from the people who are personally impacted. And that's where the listening comes in. What is happening to people on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, um, what is it that they would like the organization to work on? And that forms the foundation of your agenda. Brilliant, brilliant. And I, I just adore that you guys do that work. And just to confirm or reinforce, they, you guys get your agenda from listening. Right, right. You know, it's... Right. Oh, right. And, you know, policymakers sometimes, you know, sometimes we take out some policymakers and they go out and then they try to sell themselves, you know, which isn't listening other either. Right. So when we're talking about policymakers going out also, it's about listening. It's not about you selling whatever it is that you want to push for. Like, you know, I got an idea for a nav center and it's the greatest idea and this is why it's so great. And they're going to tell you how great it is. It's like, no, yeah. That's not what we're talking about. That's not actually listening to homeless people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 many of you know I run an online support group for homeless people, and I'm connected every day, all day long, seven days a week, to homeless people around the country. And I laugh and I cry with them every day, and it's the best thing that I've ever done. And if you work, again, if you work in homeless services or you're connected to homelessness, you've got to create some kind of a, of a vehicle where you can be actively listening on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. So important. So tell me about San Francisco. What I've seen here and from what I hear is criminalization is insane. Yeah. There's no housing anyplace. Yeah. Uh, any place. But what makes, what are the struggles here in San Francisco? What's going on and what can people do about it? How can people support you? Yeah. Yeah. We're really in a tough space here in San Francisco. We've got skyrocketed rents. I mean, our rents are outrageous. So all the kind of informal ways that people would get off the streets, you know, a room in a CD flat or, a, or an SRO room or something like that. It's, it's all the, it's all prohibitive price wise. So um, that puts a lot of pressure in terms of getting people off the streets, right? Because they're stuck on there for on the streets for long periods of time. And then, of course, you have the people being joined daily by newly homeless people that are getting displaced out of housing because of real estate speculation, um, where landlords are really unscrupulous in pushing people out. And they go after the units in poor communities because those are the ones where they that are gentrifying and they can get the big, you know, the big um, jumps in rent. And of course, they're more vulnerable because they don't have money for an attorney and all of that kind of stuff. So 
that hits from that side, so you got more and more people becoming homeless, harder and harder to get off the streets. And then you have newly affluent, new neighbors coming in that are much more affluent, that aren't as accustomed to living in poor communities, and they call and complain. And they call the police a lot. So you have this pressure cooker you know, where you have more complaints against homeless people. At the same time, we've had this whole proliferation up and down the west coast of tents, which, um, you know, a lot of people think started with um, uh, with Occupy, right. um, where people started pitching tents as a protest, and a lot of the Occupy protesters were homeless. And then it was kind of like, hey, let's try this. And uh, people started pitching tents, and um, that's more visible and therefore generates more complaints. Of course, it's very much a step up than sleeping on your own, right. where anybody walking by can kick you or steal your stuff or whatever. And you tent, have, you have a some sense little, of privacy. Little privacy, little modicum of protection, yeah. you know, a um, little bit more dignity, slightly, not perfect, obviously. Um, it's not a permanent thing. We need to get people into decent housing where they have bathrooms and showers and all that. But... This situation is just really like kind of like a, a boiling pot and the and the the politicians are all over it and they want to you know oftentimes capitalize on it and homelessness has been used as a wedge issue here for years where homeless people are scapegoated and then used for you know to get uh, politicians that are more conservative to represent downtown interest into office and it's been a string of anti homeless measures on the ballot six months in jail for panhandling six months in jail for sitting on a sidewalk. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Six months for panhandling. Six months for what they call aggressive panhandling, which is defined as asking for alms twice. Six months for sitting on the sidewalk during daytime hours on the second offense. Um, the tent ban is our most recent, which just barely passed, but did pass, where um, the police are, uh, the city's able to confiscate the tent as long as they offer just one night in shelter. So there's just these, these series of things that have kind of built up from that side. And of course, then, you know, you have the politicians, you know, really wanting, like when there's a complaint from citizen, you know, to respond to it. So there's this criminalization um, that has been increasing. Now we've had all these court cases and all these successes and um, we've, we've, we've gotten the, uh, we've halted the jailing of um, homeless people in San Francisco for being homeless uh, because we got the warrants thrown out at the court so that was really good but the police are all these having all we we negotiated a really good property policy but the police are using all these workarounds so they're doing all this massive coordination they're issuing misdemeanors so that they can confiscate the property and the tent as evidence of the misdemeanor lodging charge um, which also um, can result in jail time and a jury trial by the way and so um, we just we have like all this stuff happening, which of course is a complete waste of money, misdirected, right. I mean, six, ineffective, and incredibly inhumane. Criminalization seems to be growing, not just here, everywhere. And I believe personally, part of it is the public supports it. Not all the public. There's people like you and me mm -hmm. that have an right. affinity for homeless people. But there's the public is growing in just wanting them out of sight. Right. You know, and what we've learned in Los Angeles, because uh, I helped the city work on, I mean, there was a lot of players. Invisible people only played a small part in passing H, 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 and H. So there's right. money. And what we learned is people voted not to help homeless people, but they thought it would get them out of sight. Yeah. And yeah. now that they're still there, well, arrest them. Yeah. yeah. You know, and... I don't, it's it's so frustrating uh, because it is a complete waste of money and it does absolutely nothing. It does not work. To it, help end homelessness. It exasperates homelessness. Exactly. It exasperates because what it does is in most municipalities, you can't pay those fines, you get a warrant and you're kicked off the housing authority wait list. So you lose your access to housing. It exasperates homelessness because you may have had connection with a homeless outreach worker or somebody who you're in line for housing and they can't find you when the housing's available and it goes to somebody else. Right. Um, it exasperates homelessness because it traumatizes people and as they're being traumatized and losing their property, they're losing their identification, they're losing um, their uh, like the stuff that they need in order to succeed at getting off the streets. Right. So it's putting them back. So it exasperates homelessness. Right. It does exactly 
exactly the opposite. And also, I'm just going to say, it does nothing to decrease the visible presence of homeless yeah. people. It has never succeeded at yeah. that. There's a myth out there that that works because of Giuliani. That's not true. Yeah. What happened in New York City when Giuliani became mayor is, is that they had opened up 7,000 units of supportive housing for mentally ill people. That just happened to coincide with him getting into office because that's when those units were complete. So people in Manhattan thought that his criminalization efforts decreased the presence. It had nothing to do with yeah. that at all. So um, these are, you know, these are the things. So it doesn't even meet its, its you know, stated goals and it actually puts us backwards. And I don't even have to mention the inhumanity of this because oh, yeah, I think yeah. your listeners are full aware of, uh, of how cruel it is to kick someone when they're down and take away their right. very lost belongings um, to arrest them simply because they're too poor to afford a place to live. You brought up some great points that I was having a little Twitter conversation with somebody who works in the sector who I respect. And he called me on it and he said, oh, criminalization doesn't increase homelessness. And I said, you know what? There's no research on this. So there should be. But if for all the points you just said, uh -huh. I mean, when you're moving people around and you're taking all their stuff like their ID and you're, you know, like, for instance, in Los Angeles, they're creating a bridge housing with 72 beds. But then the hundreds of people around are in an enforcement zone, which they're just destroying their lives. Right, right. And they're just moved around, and they're yeah. not accessing services. Uh, it, it it increases homelessness. Yeah, yeah. We did, there is the one the punishing the poorest study that we did that we have on our website, but it didn't. I will link to that below. Yeah, link link to that. It 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 doesn't quite answer all the questions, but um, yeah. it certainly certainly answers quite a few. I could talk to you forever. So, um, how does the public, whether it be somebody in San Francisco that's watching this, um, or, I mean, you could be in Spokane, Washington, or Binghamton, New York. Homelessness is growing wherever you are. What can people do? Yeah, a lot of stuff. So, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, any kind of major social injustice, which homelessness is a major social injustice, um, I would say probably, you know, the biggest, you know, moral failing of our time. Um, it takes people to get involved, to roll up their sleeves and get to work. There's so many different ways to do it. First of all, people should be, as you're, you know, always talking about and, and, you know, engaging with your neighbors, unhoused neighbors or housed neighbors um, on this issue. And so, you know, talking to folks about it, finding out from your unhoused neighbors what they need, having these conversations when you're at the bar, when you're at family settings, when you're chit-chatting with neighbors, you know, really educate yourself on the issues. Um, it's easy to do, you can do it on our website. There's a number of different websites you can do it on, um, but educate yourself on the issue so that as this issue comes up, you can really talk to people. For example, San Francisco, like every municipality across, this, across the country, I think, the people here think that the homeless people come from elsewhere, right? right. And every municipality, it's actually people from that area. So these are the yes. kind of things you can talk to people about. So that's the first. So educate yourself and the second. Talk to your unhoused neighbors yeah. and engage. Talk to your housed neighbors. Um, you can get involved in neighborhood groups. You can get involved in l make sure you know what your homeless services are in your area so that when you're engaging, you can also support those. And then include this as part of your activism. You know, if you're involved in um, this next presidential campaign and volunteering for your favorite, you know, candidate number 19 or whatever, then make sure homelessness is front and center, right. you know, and engage this issue that and look and see if there's organizations like ours that are doing activist work. Um, if there aren't any, start one on your own. That's perfectly easy to do. You can just do it on your block. You can, I mean, there's so much stuff people can do. I've seen so many small groups of people make such effective change. Um, and if, as long as you go about it in an informed way, where it's centering homeless people and what you're pushing for, then um, you're, you're good as golden. Um, and I think that that's, you know, and of course, you've got elected. Keep the pressure on them. Yeah. Don't call the cops when you see a homeless person. Call your local elected yeah. and say, let's get some housing for this person. What's going on? Keep the pressure on. You know, you've got a church thing you're going to organize a phone bank and have everybody call in elected. You know, there's just there's a I could go on and on. But the yeah. the, 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 the the creative and um, fun ways to affect change on this issue are literally endless. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. All great points. You remind <laughs> me of uh, one of our writers wrote a post, and it's kind of a little play. It says, you know, uh, guide to calling the police on homeless people. And I'll paraphrase the whole article. Don't. You know, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the woman gave, the writer gave all these points of alternatives uh -huh. and basically don't call the police. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. great post. Yeah. I will link to that below, too. Thank you so much. Uh, I enjoyed Thank talking you. to you. Um, how do people support you? Well, we got a website, COHSF, which is the initials for Coalition on Homelessness, San Francisco. And um, you can support us there. There's also, you can sign up for our action alert if you're local. And we can um, make sure that you know if we need you to make one of those calls to an elected because a key thing's happening. Um, you know, right now we're in a budget struggle, so we're asking people to call their supervisors on that. Um, we'll let you know if there's a protest or some other reason um, to get informed. Or if we're, we're having a fundraiser. Um, you know, those are all ways to support the coalition. Yeah. But thanks so much for listening. No, this is a, this is a great organization. Um, I've supported them from afar for years and just happy to spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.